Another high topic of interest, uh, not only to our industry advisory board, but for all of us each year, is what the investment community is thinking. So um, we're going to get some perspectives from those in private equity and get some insights um, from a, these three gentlemen during this session. I'm going to turn it over um, to our moderator, Sam Atkins, with Ambient Insight. Can we have the slides, Vicki? There we go. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Sam, uh, Sam Atkins from Ambient Insight, and I'm moderating today. And I'm going to give you a very quick overview uh, of what we do before I turn it over to uh, Clement and Harold, who will introduce themselves. Um, we are a uh, product research company. We basically identify revenue opportunities for suppliers. So we're 100% supplier facing. So all we do is watch the buying behavior, what customers are buying, and what suppliers are selling. And I assume, are the slides behind me? Okay. I have what they call a vanity monitor in front of me, and so I'm going to assume that it's behind me as well. <laughs> um, Here's a partial list of clients. We are uh, a small company. Uh, we, the, the co-founders, my partner here is here, my co-founder, my CEO is here, Tyson Greer. We are ex-Microsoft employees and plenty of stuff before that. Uh, we, our claim to fame was we launched the first global commercial online learning business on the planet in 1995, the Microsoft Online Institute, which we called Molly. Uh, we're, we, we pride ourselves on being integrity-based, and because we're very small, we have to be very careful uh, about we, we, we don't evaluate, we don't rank, and we don't take a dime to say anything from suppliers. So. Uh, we are agnostic about policy, too. So I know we have a K-12 through audience. So we have, we're intelligent adults, and we have opinions about things, but we stay completely clear of policy. So basically, we're just watching the products that are being sold and the suppliers that are buying are, are selling it. This is our backbone, our pigeonholes. This is how we rank, pardon me, we, how we categorize. Uh, we, we are a global company. We have... We do syndicated reports and custom research for clients. We have three signature reports, series, that we do every year. We update our self-paced e-learning series, our mobile learning series, and our best-selling series is the digital English language learning series. OK, pop quiz. What country in the world buys the most digital English language software. Anybody else? The United States. So we, it is kind of a trick question, but it's a great, great piece of trivia, isn't it? Um, so this chart, if you will, is the backbone of everything we do. And so this is how we track investment activity as well. So we watch, on an ongoing basis, we watch what's being invested, what countries they're investing in, what kind of company, and, what, and, and who they're facing, K-12 or consumer. And so this is the backbone not only of our research, but it's also the backbone of our investment. We, our investment uh, uh, research, we believe that investment, private investment, is a leading indicator. And I'll get the fellows here to chime in on whether that's an accurate estimate or, or uh, uh, assumption. But we believe that by watching this, we believe that if the investors believe that this is going to be hot or this is going to make money in the future, that this is, so, this is a leading indicator that allows us to go, get a little bit ahead of the, the evidence that we're tracking at the moment. Now. If you want to do this yourself, we update the white paper, the investment white paper, every year and, and a couple times during the year. It's up there on the website now. The presentation is up there on the website now. 
in our library, our free library. But we use public domain resources. So if you want to do this yourself and track the private investment made to education companies or any kind of company, these are three resources you can do. I will tell you that you got to keep on top of it if you're doing this yourself. Because if you wait two weeks and go up on Crunchbase, that you're going to spend hours and hours. Now, we're obsessive about it, so we go every couple of days and track it, and then we, we track how much they made, when they, when, they, when they got the investment. What we do not do, and it's a question I'll, I'll open to the gentleman here, is what we do not do is we do not track who the investor was. But if you go up on these sites, you can really clearly see who are the private investors who are making these, these investments. Okay, you ready? We've been watching this a long time. I've been in learning technology since the 80s. We used to call it computer-based training when I started. So I've been watching private investment for a long, long time. This is what we call longitudinal. Look at the spike. Now, one of the questions I'll open to the, to the people on the, on the panel here today is, um, last year, in 2012, was the highest investment made in the history of the learning technology industry. So we, we, we have opinions about this, but, but the investment patterns change really rapidly. But this is where it is as of two weeks ago for this year. And I submitted this deck two weeks ago. Since this deck was submitted, $57 million more has been invested in learning technology companies. So who knows if it's going to, to, to beat last year, but already this is, this is pretty impressive. Now, I've talked to suppliers, and they say relative to the investment community or investment <coughs> environment that these numbers, you know, why aren't they higher, you know? But I, you know, I come from the education and, and, and training industry. These numbers are, are, are amazing to me. There's a number of reasons why. The world is an amazing place to be right now. Uh, the digitization efforts across the planet are extraordinary. And I'll show you a slide, particularly the, the uptake of tablets. But we watched seven regions. Uh, I just finished Africa mobile learning, and now I'm, I'm, I'm off to Western Europe, I believe, I think is my next assignment. But um, Africa is an amazing place right now. We have these stereotypes in America about you know, poverty and illness, et cetera, et cetera. Some of the most vibrant economies are places like Ru Rwanda, Angola, uh, uh, Uganda, amazing place, Africa. So there's a number of factors that are going on right now uh, outside the United States. Now, quickly, let's go into, narrow it down into pre-K through 12. This is last year's activity. Now, we, we, and this is another question I'll, I'll pose to the gentleman here, is we believe, and you, you guys can contradict me, we thought that inv investors buy into recessions with education investments. However, this is a very extraordinary economy we've had for the last couple of years, <clears throat> so it's another question I'll throw open to the, the gentleman here. It's because clearly you see the spike in the general investment and in K through 12. We had an extraordinary environment in 2000, 2001. <coughs> we had the, we had the dot com burst. We had 9/11. It was it was irrational exuberism, exuberance. Uh, so we drew the conclusion that it was a recession type thing. But clearly, this it's not this investment activity is not mapping right now to the economy. Perhaps it is. All, these guys are the experts. And here's where we are so far this year. Now, since two weeks ago when I submitted this, we had about 3 million more. Not much in K-12, but we still have a whole quarter to go. Now, where's it going? We watch eight product types. And so this is, this is, this is where the money is going. Right now, there's because of a number of factors that that circular diagram I showed you, the, the, that the mobile learning now in the United States is um, 
This is actually a global chart. Um, so you have the, the proliferation of tablets right now. So you have, it's kind of a resurgence or uh, if not a, a renaissance now of mobile learning content. These are the top 10 last year that we tracked. In each one of these, and I won't go through this because you'll never get me off the stage, each one of these are very different companies. I know, I know ePals are here, correct? Um, uh, Edmodo is more or less, is Edmodo here? Before I botch their uh, product description. Um, they're social learning. They have, they, you know, it's sort of like a classroom management system. By the way, we only watch learning technology. We don't watch print print based or classroom based. So this they have a, 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 a modicum or, or, or a degree of social factors in their or features in their software. So the teacher can not only monitor what students are doing, but they can also monitor behavior, you know, attitude, et cetera, et cetera. I don't know how they do that. But anyway, these are the top ones. You know, and in, 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 in one pattern we see, we saw last year, was in higher education investors went for companies with established cash flow. In K through 12, last year, investors went for startups. Having said that, scientific learning has been around for a long time. So, so in general, the, the investors last year were going, in the K through 12 market at least, were going for startups, but they were also investing relatively small amounts of money in the startups. I, I, I know we're talking about K through 12, but I want to put this in context. We call the white paper that this is drawn from is on our library. It's an, we update it every year. There's, there's, there, there's another white paper too. We, every year we update the K through 12 in higher education uh, white paper about the, the trends in, in the United States and the, in, in, in the global trends. I want to put this in context. This is why we subtitled that white paper this year, Education Goes Retail, is the companies that are being funded right now are consumer facing for the most part as far as the, the, where the cash flow is going, as far as from the investment community. Uh, when we started out in 1999, when, when the first investment spike happened in 1999, the overwhelming majority of those companies were consumer facing and not a single one exists anymore because consumers weren't ready. But now, for, for something called online learning or, or whatever, but now what you see is a huge uptake in uh, the buying behavior of parents, particularly for <coughs> early language learning and uh, early childhood learning apps. Okay, quickly I'll preach a little bit. I'll read, I'll, it depends on where we're at. We were just in Shanghai and, and this slide said all, all roads lead to China. Uh, this all roads lead to mobile. Look at these numbers. Now the reason I didn't put Egypt in the table is because the announcement was made about them going to buy these, purchase these tablets was made one government back and about a couple months ago. And since then the, the army, you know, having said took out Morsi, you know, or, or replaced Morsi. So I, I said that we're, we're agnostic about policy. We do watch government behavior. Uh, things, this could change, and we watch it on an ongoing basis. Uh, the government of Thailand, the current government of Thailand, obviously you've heard about that, you know, is every child in Thailand, every primary student in Thailand will have a laptop within the next year or two. That government can change. India is having elections right now, federal elections. That government promised 20 million tablets. So my point is this is where we're at at the moment and we're tracking this, but it can change uh, on any given day. Now, look at the LA. Is, is everybody familiar with the Los Angeles decision to buy 650,000 tablets? Uh, that's, you know, a year or two ago, you know, we were used to seeing, you know, uh, 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 purchases of a school district uh, 4,000 tablets maybe, or 400 tablets for the eighth grade or whatever. So we'll see what this, and there's a number, I know there's a debate and there's controversy about what LA is doing, but uh, what you're seeing right now is a, a massive adoption of tablets across the education system as a whole on the planet. 
And we're all, I'm going to turn this over to the panel here. Everyone know that for some reason I'm going to keep the ac acronym, the one laptop per child is now a tablet. So all the governments that have, that have committed to buying new OLPCs are actually buying tablets. Uh, Samsung came out less than 30 days ago or so with a, a branded education tablet. In the last two years, over 85 personal learning devices have come on the market. Their sole purpose of these tablets is education. And I put this one up here as kind of gratuitous, is the Fuhu. Uh, it's an American company, but uh, 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 Japanese company, uh, uh, pardon me, um, uh, the second largest Japanese company invested in them, and they're going to bring the Fuhu <coughs> content tablet into Japan. And then be, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Harold and Clement, and we didn't decide who's going to go first, so <laughs> we can flip a coin. But uh, basically, uh, we are not private investment experts, per se. We just track the activity. So I'm kind of glad to be here today. I'm very glad to be here, actually, because I'm learning as well, because we are constantly asked by companies we work for, how does it work? How do I get investment? And it's my assumption, I've been told, that you can't cold call, which is kind of the first question I'll throw open to the gentleman here. You can't just call and make an appointment with an investor. We never broker. I know some analysts do that. We never get in the middle between an investor and a, and a company. The last thing I'll say is kind of uh, emotional or whatever. We see, in startups in particular, we see a lot of passion in education startups, but an awful lot of really incredible naivete, uh, lack of marketing, lack of sales training. The thing we often have, companies come to us, they've been working on our product for a year or two years, and then they come to us and ask us if there's a market for it. So having said that, we see a lot of passion in education type companies, but then we also see that they're so passionate about education and we're going to change the world that they get blindsided by, the fact, by reality basically, and particularly in the K-12 system in the United States, and it's different in every country in the world. But in the United States, it's a really difficult place. So I'm going to turn it over to the gentleman. Did I go over my time? I defer to the senior member. Oh. Ooh. <laughs> See, I refrain from making any remarks like age and beauty and so on. <laughs> All right. Um, so thank you for that, and I think it was a very helpful presentation. I think puts it all into a broad context. Um, some of the data there I hadn't seen before, and I think is very useful and frames the um, debate in a helpful way. Um, what I'm going to do in my 10 minutes or so is, uh, yeah, what I'm going to do in uh, 10 minutes or so is um, first uh, explain why I'm here. Uh, then walk through what I think the problem is in ed tech, what can be done, make a couple of predictions, because I always think that people come to these conferences ought to get some predictions, and then talk a little bit about the investment strategy that we use uh, and what I see in investment strategies of my, of my peers. Um, and <clears throat> I, uh, I look forward to the questions. So that said, um, my name is Harold Levy. I used to be school's chancellor in New York City, including, I guess, in 2000 for about three years, including during 9-11 for my sins. Um, before that, I was associate general counsel of Citigroup, and before that, I was at Solomon Brothers, uh, at Phillip Brothers, um, and you can see how a career in securities law and litigation is a fine preparation <laughs> to be school's chancellor um, of the largest school district in the country. Um, New York City has about 2% of the population. We have 1,100,000 children. Today it's about 980,000. Um, and uh, before that, I was a member of the New York State Board of Regents. After that, for six years, I was at Kaplan as EVP. Uh, and I'm currently at Palm Ventures, which is a family office that invests in early stage education businesses, uh, distressed education businesses, um, we like businesses that are struggling where we think we can put them on their, on a road. 
and we've had a fair amount of success. Um, our, our biggest success, I suppose, was Healed Colleges, which we got and bought for single-digit millions, made a relatively small investment and within two years, sold it for about 400 million. Now, they're not all like that, but it's nice to have a couple of those under your belt. Um, and let me just make one comment on what was just said. Uh, I like cold calls. Um, <laughs> so anybody who's interested in talking with me, please feel free. Uh, email, you know, H. Levy at Palm Ventures. Um, and I'm happy to talk. Um, let me run quickly through where I see things, basis some of the data and sort of some of the conversation earlier this morning. Um, one, I think educators, I think investors see education, uh, particularly K-12, as the last sector uh, to be disrupted. Um, akin to travel before Barry Diller got involved, akin to uh, the news before Ted Turner and Roger Ailes taught us something about how the news ought to work. Um, disruption in education, however, is slower than most investors can wait. And accordingly, uh, we heard this morning the whole discussion about there's a timeline to scale. That's critical in the way that investors think about this. Um, so the message for me is traction beats tech every time. You got to grow it. And tech without pedagogues is deficient. I hate when techies come and tell me this is how it should be done. It's clear and obvious. <laughs> it's not clear and obvious. They're very smart people who have been doing this for a long time in the pedagogical world, as most of the people in this conference well know. And they weren't born yesterday. And if it were easy, it would have been solved. My own view, um, well, I'll come to that. Um, so what can be done? Um, I think investors need a careful screen. Palm invests in two or three businesses a year to give you a flavor for how difficult this is. Um, and again, the people in this room are only too well aware of how tough these decisions are. Um, technology businesses without a pedagogue, in my view, are suspect. You not only need domain expertise, but you need site-specific human capital. When David Coleman came to me uh, with what became GrowNet, later bought by McGraw-Hill, I said, if it was any more complicated than an ATM machine, I didn't want to see it. That's a good standard to use. Teachers are busy. They need simplicity. School superintendents do not like doing regressions. They like dashboards. Um, I'm about the most metric-driven school superintendent we've had perhaps with the exception of Joel Klein, and I hate sitting down and trying to go through complicated data. I certainly know that kindergarten teachers do not want to be doing this. Um, the example given this morning by uh, Jonathan Harbour, I thought captured the moment perfectly. He said they had a digital product at Pearson that they were selling. It was only going to be digital, and the RFP committee asked for a printout, okay? <laughs> How dumb is that? What do they then know about user interface, feel and touch? Zero. Zero. And yet they wanted to see content in hard paper. Okay, I get why they want to see content. But that tells you everything you need to know about how screwed up the system is on the procurement side. Schools lack discernment. RFP committees have no capacity to judge quality. If you're lucky, you find a math teacher on it. You never find a technologist, never. There are no school districts at this conference. You'd think they'd want to know what's coming down the pike. There are none who go to ASU, yet we're seeing the best technology companies here. Same at South by Southwest.edu, the best techie conference out there. I've gone to it every year it's been in existence. They get a handful of districts. No, the problem here is that there's no Gartner group for EdTech. The problem here is the buying consortia have political objectives. The BOCES in New York take a cut, and that seems to be their reason for existence. They work, the, a consortia works only when the superintendents cede control over the buying decision, and that will happen never. 
No superintendent worth his salt is ever going to give that up. It's, it's too frightening. The I zone, in my judgment, in New York is, a prin is principal power run amok. Principals don't have time to assess this and make sensible decisions out of it. It's hard enough for us as investors. It's hard enough for you guys. Can you imagine somebody who, by the way, has to run a 3,000 student school in their spare time? Partnership, the idea that partnership could replace adoption, which we heard earlier today, I think is fanciful. No superintendent is going to let that happen. Because, you know, the argument is, well, we'll be with you through thick or thin. Newsflash. The thin point is when I want to fire those people. Right? I'm the superintendent. I'm going to get all hell when my scores go down dramatically. What do I want to be able to do? You're out. The idea that I'm going to say, no, I'm going to lock arms with them. They meant well. Right? Ask McGraw-Hill about that. Ask Pearson about that. And... and, and um, the words of a uh, vice presidential candidate, you know, how's that going for you? Um, the success contract, I think, is a more likely thing, but the politics of that is fraught. So some hard predictions, and then I'll, I'll, I'll turn to my colleague, and he can tell me all the things I've said wrong. Um, one, I think e-books in schools will happen in a big way when we accept bring your own device. Um, and even bring your own device has to overcome the IT people because you'll get a plethora of different devices and they'll just be fighting you tooth and nail. Or when we have $80 tablets um, and $80 tablets that really work. It's coming, not here yet. Second prediction, I think free will make inroads before pay because teachers will go rogue. Edutopia, for example, is rich with content the freemium model, or almost free, like Edmodo and Schoology, I think that has legs. Or models that don't charge schools, like Clever. And also students are going to go rogue. The MOOCs is the best example of that. My, my favorite example in this world is, while Governor Schwarzenegger was governor in California, he retained very, very good producers to come up with a chemistry textbook. It is online today, as we speak at CLRN, okay, clrn.org, check it out. The last time I looked, there are a half a dozen publishers selling chemistry textbooks. I don't think there's a big difference between California chemistry and North Carolina chemistry, yet somebody's buying this stuff. That's how bad the discernment is, and that's how bad our RFP committees are advised. Three, interactive businesses that require bandwidth or significant bandwidth to get, are, are not going to get scale for a couple of years yet. And that's when the FCC E-rate initiative kicks in, which will be in two or three years. There are going to be districts who will build the scale so as to allow the product. But talk about a capital investment. That's really pricey especially if you've got these big, fat, old pre-World War I buildings that have big, thick walls that really know how to keep out Wi-Fi. Four, testing consortia will have less impact on speeding e-readers e into the schools than anticipated, in my judgment. I thought that the two testing consortia requiring online testing would speed online products. However, the states cannot take the heat of low scores. Look at New York. Combined with the Tea Party resistance to Common Core, because they view it as a manifestation of federal power, states are beginning to flee the testing regime. We've seen, you know, as you heard, we've seen um, Florida Governor Rick Scott yesterday announce withdrawal from PARC. Um, Oklahoma, Pennsylvania, North Dakota, Alabama, withdrawn or limited participation. I think we're going to see perhaps another 10 states. Interestingly, there is the conflict between Rick Scott and Jeb Bush. Stay tuned. I love that. Um, I think there are going to be more renegades. I don't know how many. I'm not pretending I've got insight here. Um, I think Common Core will still prevail. I think Jonathan Harbour from Pearson has that right. 
but it's not the common core we thought it was going to be, and it's not going to be hinged on these consortia, which a lot of us were waiting for. Um, five, modularized content, I think, is the future, not the chunky stuff we've been seeing. I would bet on Engage before Amplify. Um, six, I think other big players are going to emerge, and I'll make one prediction. I think Parchment will be among them. We can't all be bought by Pearson. <laughs> yes, you can. Yeah, <laughs> yes, we can. This is wishful thinking right here. Um, he doesn't have to, he says he doesn't have to be political. I love that. Okay, so I'll make up for it. Okay, you're doing fine. Um, good job on that. Good, good job on that. <laughs> last, last point. Um, I think niche plays are still possible, but fewer and more select. Again, I said at Palm, we aim to make two or three investments a year. Um, the kind of things that you look for. One, um, New York's Bill de Blasio. I think he's going to be the real education mayor. Not that I've got criticism for Mike Bloomberg, who I think did a, you know, tried hard, did well, didn't get to exactly where he wanted to be. But de Blasio is talking about a tax raise for pre in order to pay for pre-K. That's a guy who's going to put money into education. He's basing his mayoralty on a tax increase to fund pre-K. Well, there are going to be others who are going to go down that road. Second, the converse side of that, the Tea Party states are going to be left behind. They are the backwaters today, thank you Alabama, and they will stay there. Third, um, tech that's almost gaming strikes me as really good and some of the gaming stuff. Um, I was involved in, I mean I can talk about this because I'm no longer an investor, late night labs, uh, something that Macmillan bought. It's a simulated lab. I think that's a great business because it feels like a game and you can get to you know, tell the kids at MIT who are using it who say, oh, well, I wonder what happens when I mix this and that and put it in a, you know, in a centrifuge. Well, you know what? It blows up and you get to see it on, on the screen instead of all over your lab. And you also let the community college kids play with it in a different way. That's engaging. What's this all about? More time on task. Um, I'll mention one that we have invested in, Sangari. It's inquiry-based science. Science is going to happen. Um, you know, the programs that are based on Arduinos, um, which is a microcontroller processor. The schools are doing it. The teachers are doing it. Someone's going to make money off of that. Final observation, and this is a little off point, but I want to I want to just drive home the proposition that we as investors and as technologists do not have delivered wisdom on what works. We fumble, we stumble, we get it wrong, and if we're lucky, we get one right and we hit a home run. But the best example I can give is, is the following. The ultimate issue in education in this country today is why do the black kids do so poorly and why do the Asian kids do so well? And it's one question. Right? And it's not biology. Right? We all know the data on this. It's not biology. But it's something else going on. And unless we address that as a community of investors and technologists and educators, we're missing the boat. Right? That's the big elephant in the room. My own view is it has to do with caregiver. Who's the parent? Where are the parents and why are they out to lunch? Data point. 25% of the children in this country in K-12 are out a month each year. They are not truant, because that's a legal term in most states, but they're chronically absent. Okay? Surprise? That's the crowd that's at the bottom of performance. When we fix that by engagement, by more time on task, by after school, by all the different data analysis programs we've seen, by all the different things that we do get to look at, that's the ultimate bogey to figure that out. Get them into school, get them engaged, and get them to perform. It's not because they can't do it. It's because we have a system of education that requires enormous amount of positive reinforcement from the home. 
and it isn't there. So that's what we ought to ultimately be looking to, which is not to say that all the various programs that we have looked at don't get there. They do, just a little bit around the corner. Anyway, those are the kind of things I like to look for in investments, and those are the kind of sieves I use. Over to Quantum. I feel as if I should just say I look at the balance sheet and that's it. You know? <laughs> oh, that. There's that, yeah. Um, I thought I'm Clement Erbman, uh, Managing Director of First Analysis in Chicago. Uh, we're a pr growth private equity fund, growth meaning not doing startups and not doing leveraged buyouts, but there is an a, a investment uh, position in the middle of that which we uh, invest in companies that already show some revenue traction, um, not necessarily EBITDA positive, uh, but need some capital in order to get to the next level. But um, as we call it, the dog's eating the dog food. We need to see that. We need to see there's interest in the marketplace for the product or the service, primarily service, actually. Um, we come about um, our th investment thesis in a slightly different way uh, from most private equity investors uh, in that we identify the areas that we feel have a number of public companies but have a very uh, uh, fertile uh, field of young companies and making sure that there's something within that industry that is causing um, the disruption or, or, or causing the change. Um, in the case of education, we, we decided that uh, broadband would change over time. Uh, it's the same kind of thing as we did with uh, internet security. Um, we sat down and said, well, yeah, there's this internet developing. Um, what's going to make it work? What's going to allow people to put their social security numbers on it, their phone numbers, and uh, really interact with the net? And we, we focused then on, on security and how security would uh, enable uh, activity on the internet. So we've done, for instance, in that area, we've done about 14 uh, internet security investments, including uh, RSA, which is one of the, um, the larger companies in that field. So in education, we thought, um, still think, that uh, the, the, the broadband, the, the, uh, the, the expansion of the pipe uh, would allow greater and greater media to flow uh, to the school systems as the E-rate started up and then uh, as the developments occurred after that. And I think at this point um, we can't, uh, I agree with, with Harold that um, uh, the, it's not expanding at the same rate as uh, the consumer market is expanding, but it still is a focus and there still is investment going on. Um, Sam talked about um, uh, Africa. Um, I happen to be from Africa, so it's a special interest to me. Um, in Kenya, what the, what the Department of Education is doing, um, has they've taken over the shortwave uh, spectrum, and they are putting a Wi-Fi system in the whole country, first along the major highways. Uh, so. It, all the kids within three years in Kenya will have access, Wi-Fi access, uh, to the Internet. So uh, you're seeing in Africa, you're seeing in Asia, um, uh, an ability to leapfrog our infrastructure um, in order to, to become connected. Um, so what does that say about you know, what we look for, uh, what first analysis looks for? Uh, first thing is we, we invest in minority positions. We're not, uh, we're not smart enough to be operators, um, and I certainly think we know our limitations on that. Um, and uh, so we want to back good management, and management that has the uh, ability to understand shifts in the marketplace. 
a management that has an ability to uh, be flexible, uh, to be able to, to choose a point at when to cut it off and move on, um, management that's able to build a good team around them. Good teams are, are absolutely essential. We look at recurring revenue models, either in service or in products. We look at 25% growth uh, as, uh, as a limit. We're looking in our investments, when we do our analysis, we want to see at least 30, 35% IRRs. Um, and we need to see um, companies that have an ability uh, to build a $100, $100 million uh, company. Uh, so it's not, it's a niche, uh, a, but a substantial niche and not um, just a, uh, an application that is for a point in time. So we're looking for something disruptive. Um, what, just thought I would um, uh, indicate some of our investments. Um, one of our investments, talk about a niche investment, ability to build a $100 million company. Um, education behind the bars. We uh, supported a company that developed software to train people who are behind, who are, uh, behind the bars. Um, and reduce in recidivism. So, um, mm -hmm. prison, pri yes, prisons. So um, the company was successful. We we sold it on, um, but so we we were very early in the uh, mid '80s. Um, we were the first so-called at that time environmental investors. So if something has a social impact. Uh, that's a positive to us, but not a reason to invest. Um, currently, we have an investment in a company called Advanced Path Academics. Advanced Path Academics is a private-public partnership that does an academy within a district school. So with the understanding that um, the student uh, who is, has either dropped out or is at risk of dropping out has not been successful in the normal school environment. Uh, so what Advanced Path does is create an environment for them that is heavily um, uh, computerized um, that they can and, uh, and driven now uh, by the increase in broadband uh, your, the ability to, to individualize the learning and deliver that individualized learning uh, to the student um, enables them to be taken out of the environment where they have not been successful and into an environment where um, there's a change in the way they are taught, there's a change in the way the uh, teachers interact with them and they have an ability to, to become successful. And we've had a very good success rate and, and build that company's building nicely. Um, I'll get to, um, I'll also have an investment in a company called learning.com, which is a platform uh, that started out originally teaching technology literacy um, to about four million students. Uh, then we figured out that we've got a platform that works, let's add additional content to that. And currently um, there are uh, 80 partners um, you, delivering in that distribution system uh, their content over that platform. Um, I want to uh, go along, I guess, uh, do we have time? Why don't I stop there? Um, in the description was a discussion of, of accelerators um, incubators. It, and incubators, um, and there's a reason for them. Uh, there is a, an important role that they play in the development of capital in the, in, in the education industry, and there's a whole infrastructure around them that will make them sustainable through these different investment periods. Uh, just to hit two points, um, in terms of do investors buy in recessions, I think there are a number of different types of investors. 
Um, we certainly uh, do all our own work and we are very focused. Uh, we are, uh, look at industries uh, where, um, that are not in good economic times and we'll be definitely looking at companies um, to back who can um, navigate those difficult times or in the process of navigating difficult times. Um, I, the reason an op, a number of investors stay away in that because time is a very important component of the investment cycle. Um, you're looking at IRRs, internal rates of return, and if you've got three years of recession and flat, three years of flat, uh, you need to have greater growth at the end of that in order to, to make up your IRR. So, um, cold calls. My number, uh, uh, I, take call, number. <laughs> I take cold calls and uh, encourage it. And um, for us to make good investments, we need to see a lot of investments and to be able to choose the best that fit our parameters. So we encourage people to call us, to meet us, to come and see us, uh, and that's why we, we come to the conferences. That is the major reason for us to come to conferences. So see Urban at fana.com <laughs> anytime. Come into Chicago. You say you'll be there. Come and see us. And uh, I think in the limited time we should open it up for questions. Um, I'm not quite sure how this works, but uh, 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 this panel is now open to the audience to ask questions. I think the microphone's over there. <clears throat> Two microphones. Come on. <laughs> Any questions from the audience? W one of the questions, um, there we go. Somebody coming up? One of the questions I have is, um, for, for the gentleman, is what are the biggest mistakes you've seen made by people that are coming to pitch to you? You know, what glaring mistakes, or what are the biggest mistakes companies make when they come to you? Uh, the biggest mistake is I'll build it and they'll come. Is what? I will build the, the, the product <laughs> and they will come. I don't need to have any interaction with customers because I know what is needed in the marketplace and um, uh, spend a lot of money building it and uh, I know it will work. Yeah, I agree with that. I think the, the, the biggest problem I've seen is, um, you know, what I alluded to. The technology is important and um, we don't need teachers around to help us with it. Um, in my judgment, it's all about implementation and it's all about making sure that what you're building is user friendly. Um, let, me, let me just make the observation. I think what you're seeing uh, in this panel is um, a useful dichotomy. Um, Clem's oriented toward growth, I'm oriented toward venture. Um, he looks for businesses that are, as you heard, on a certain trajectory of continued growth and where he takes a minority position. We look for businesses that um, are probably at an earlier stage, and, and correct me if that's wrong, but I think what we look for is something that has much more accelerated growth or where we think we can make um, a significant contribution to management. Um, we don't have to have uh, majority or control, um, but we tend to be on the larger end of um, involvement. And, and our theory is um, that we may not be the cheapest money, but we're more hands-on and we can help. Question, please. Hey, um, Karen. Karen Billings from the Software and Information Industry Association. We've seen a tremendous growth in the number of incubators, the programs, the companies, the startups. Every city has the meetups. Um, there's a lot of small investments, friends and family, angels, etc. Let's say that out of every hundred of these, how many do you think will be around in two years on some kind of growth, even if it's to be acquired by somebody else, but will you know will be successful in some way. I think a I think a very small number will be successful. Uh, tiny. 
And I go to the mashups in New York and in Boston and in D.C. and the meetups and try and find the needle in the haystack, but it's constant, constant search and evaluation and trying to figure out what might be there and what might not. The, <clears throat> the numbers that Sam showed us before about the heavy investment here um, I think is revealing that it's focused on mobile and customer. Very hard to get into the districts, very hard to scale, and particularly if you're just a you know, startup with no, no sales force. Um, you know, we can help there, but this is a hard road. And I think, um, you know, for better or for worse, our system is such that there'll be a lot of roadkill. Clem? Yeah, I, um, I think that we really have to look back and why, um, th thanks for the question, why are there the incubators and the accelerators? Um, the first one, I think, was started in about 2005. Um, they started out in technology. There are now, um, I counted them up, there are 26 incubators or locations for incubators mm -hmm. in the country. Um, and each has um, somewhat uh, of a competition. They draw between 100 and 300 applicants. And then uh, the 10 or 8 are chosen out of those. And um, then they fit in. Um, the incubator provides space and provides mentorship and provides an ecosystem where a company can get up and operational and testing their market. So it's not just the incubators. There's a whole ecosystem behind them of lawyers, accountants, private equity people, uh, academics that are all supporting this uh, flow of innovation. Um, and there are numerous uh, universities have courses on entrepreneurship and innovation. Um, what the internet has done is it opened up the accessibility for anybody at any level to satisfy a, a question, a quest that they have to, to, uh, to pursue. Um, so um, the, there have been a number of successes coming out of incubators. Success is going to breed success. Um, there is a whole a formalized angel investor community out there surrounding each of the incubators, angels and super angels, these people who have seen money made uh, from startups and want to participate in that. So um, I think it's a, a trend that has some legs to it. Um, and uh, I think it will fluctuate, I do believe, in cycles, so it will and I think we're looking at, at that map, we're looking at pretty close to the top of a cycle. Um, but there will be fluctuations, but I do believe that, the, there, that we have to pay attention to, we do, and the community has to pay attention to incubators and accelerators because they are part of the ecosystem and they will become a more and more important part of the ecosystem, giving an ability of people to to follow a dream and uh, be able to uh, have that dream funded and bring to market. Go ahead, please. Great, I wanted to add a follow-on question about crowdfunding, the new legalization of crowdfunding and um, groups like AngelList and others where startups can get their own seed capital and is that informing your decisions? Are you looking at that? Are you participating? What is your thoughts about the role? Um, we have I mean, we do some angel investing ourselves and um, have done a couple, of e a couple each year. Um, I, I'm pleased to report we've done pretty well in our uh, selections. I don't really follow what, you know, the Kickstarters of the world are doing because I think there's a different mission there. Uh, we, we happen to own a college in California, a regionally accredited school called Cogswell, um, that has a degree in entrepreneurship and innovation. Um, it's an online degree, it's also an on-the-ground program, and it's actually quite fascinating to see how um, the students who come through today, who in the past might have been interested in digital media, or you know, they, 
they wanted to work for Pixar and they wanted to, uh, you know, they could, they've been gamers their whole lives and they can do this better. And now they're coming through and they have a very interesting twist on that. And they say, I'm not interested so much in working for Pixar or working for education arts or entertainment arts. Uh, I want to be Steve Jobs. I want to be uh, the guy who runs it. Thank you very much. I can do this and I don't need the platform. And the technology allows them now to actually step outside and do that. Um, there are a large number of people, kids, who come up through these kinds of um, colleges that Clem referred to, either with a degree or with a business degree or with something in the nature of a commerce degree, because about 30% of our students in undergraduate institutions today take basically a business undergrad degree. It's very, very high. It's not like in the old days where you had a significant number of kids doing gen, you know, gen ed and classes. And where they're headed now is because they've been so attuned to the internet where everybody can be a publisher and everyone can have access to leapfrog over the, the, the banks and the, the, um, you know, the, the historic gatekeepers uh, and reach right into um, angel networks, incubators, accelerators, uh, you know, the, 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 the folks who might want to do some venture investing or some angel investing seed level. Um, so we're seeing a whole different flow, and the historic barriers and articulation points that we're so used to um, have just fallen by the wayside. Um, you know, we talk about the flipped classroom. There's a flipped economy going on in this entrepreneurship world, um, and we're kind of seeing it in real time. Um, when a Macmillan can reach down and pick out an early stage, or a Pearson can do that, or a Scholastic can do that, that's one thing. But here we have a whole different crowd of people using very different technologies and techniques. Uh, I think it's exciting and interesting and barrier breaking. I think the crowdsourcing uh, is working. Uh, there are a number of companies have, have raised less than a million dollars um, in, in the marketplace. Um, somewhat stimulated by the Jobs Act uh, which, in, which sets up the legal framework to enable this to occur. Uh, one could also argue because the Jobs Act has just become effective and people are using it, it's now the top of the market as well in that area. Um, but um, I think that has legs to and um, any mechanism for raising capital uh, is positive in the society. Uh, innovation is, is part of the very fabric and uh, all these issues, all this, all this infrastructure is encouraging that and uh, the broadband, the band, the internet, uh, the angels are all part of that and, um, uh, and I think th I'm very optimistic at looking at the entire economy as being able to really be driven by technology starting with education technology in the schools and giving the students an idea, ideas that uh, there aren't those old barriers that used to exist. There's money available in small amounts and larger amounts and ability to pursue dreams um, with far fewer barriers today than they ever have been. We've reached the end of the panel. Uh, thanks to everybody for coming today and turn it over to Vicki. Great. Please join me in Good thanking job. this panel. Very interesting. Time for lunch.